Okay, looks like we're looks like we're recording. So this week's uh, announcement, I'm afraid, is going to be a bit lengthy. Uh, we're getting into some really deep, serious philosophical terrain. So that's all the more reason why in both the uh, screen version, but also this video version, I'm going to insert graphics and videos whenever possible to make it a bit more engaging. So let me start off by observing that our author has done three extraordinary things in this chapter. The first, after a couple of chapters upping his citation game, I'm afraid he's fallen back into making all too many broad and unsubstantiated assertions, mostly tacitly assuming that the distinctive um, theism of the Abrahamic traditions is the only one that counts as such. Hence why I'm here, I guess. The second, he devoted an entire chapter to the problem of evil without once sending out the philosopher who first articulated that problem, Epicurus. So, who was Epicurus and how did he phrase the problem of evil? Fortunately, as it happens, I recently wrote an announcement about Epicurus for another class I teach. Uh, and I, I was putting up the Epicurean tradition in juxtaposition with its friendly rival, the Stoics. So here is the key points that I think you need to know. Both of these were rival schools of thought in the ancient world that addressed the same question. Eudaimonia, which is the question, what constitutes a good life while lived? They were overall friendly rivals. And in fact, there were some overlapping concepts and some people in the Epicurean school would quote, given Stoics with approval and vice versa. Uh, Seneca, one of the greatest of the Stoic philosophers, had appreciative things to, be said, to say about Epicurean philosophy, for example. They both believed that the ideal form of life could be known and pursued. They both prized cultivating a simple and disciplined lifestyle with little, if anything, in the way of luxury. But there were some key differences. For the Stoics, the purpose of life was virtue, which they believed led in turn to a pleasant existence. This was to be pursued by cultivating self-control and self-discipline. The Epicureans instead saw maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain to be self-evident uh, goals. Although according to Epicurus, intellectual pleasures were to be preferred to physical pleasures. A short-term pleasure that resulted in long-term suffering was not to be pursued. Contrary, why something that resulted in short-term suffering but would result in long-term pleasure was to, be, was to be pursued. For example, rigorous exercise. Who else really loves it? Um, in the minute that you're doing a rigorous exercise, it's unpleasant, but it leads to better physical health. Similarly, <coughs> abstaining from unhealthy foods might be unpleasant, but by eating, cultivating a simple, healthy diet, you will live longer and more healthfully and enjoy your life more. The pleasures to be pursued according to the Epicureans were those that were both natural and necessary. For example, simple nutritious food was natural and necessary. Natural but unnecessary pleasures, such as fine luxurious cuisine, for example, was not to be pursued. And pleasures that were both unnatural and unnecessary, such as the continued pursuit of money, fame, and power, were to be avoided. A simple lifestyle <coughs> shared with good friends was the ideal for the Epicureans. Stoicism encouraged people to engage in public life Epicureans instead preferred to live together in a community with fellow Epicureans. Um, in the print version of this announcement, I am linking um, some articles that uh, give further information about the Epicureans and their friendly rivals, the Stoics. Both of these schools uh, fell out of favor with the coming of Christianity, but are now being rediscovered, reevaluated, and appreciate it. So let's turn to Epicurus and his take on the problem of evil. 
of why is Epicurus framing of this problem relevant? First, credits to where it's due, he was the first person to articulate this problem. And his frame of it is still well regarded. I suspect our author might have a bias regarding citing <coughs> pre-Christian sources, which I'll get to before the end of this announcement. So how was the problem of evil originally articulated by Epicurus? Since I've been informed that the younger generation prefers a mix of graphics with words, I think I'll resort to some memes at this point. So let me, ah, here we go. So, Epicurus famously, famously said, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both willing, able, and willing? Then when, whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? Uh, to break that down a little, I have an image of the same uh, statement, but done in a flow chart, which I think is a little bit more easy to follow. Also, I had to share this because I find it amusing. Uh, I can totally see Epicurus in the form of a beatnik poet at a poetry slam doing a literal mic drop. So, observations and clarifications. Once again, I have to point out that our author claims, what our author claims is the theistic God may be much more accurately understood as the Abrahamic God, which is a much more delimited category, e.g. a God that is simultaneously omnipotent, omniscient, and entirely good. Most world religions besides the Abrahamic traditions would have issues with one or another of those assumptions. Page 93, our author states, we can hardly deny the reality of evil in this world. I need must refer you to Voltaire's proto-novel, Candide, in which he scathingly mocks a belief system of his time, in which philosophers and theologians infer that given an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving God, there must, we must live in the best of all possible worlds. And thus, any suffering or evil we witness is illusory, delusory, or insignificant. I have a link to one of the major philosophers that first coined that particular theodicy. Therefore, there is a long history of people in the Western tradition making just that denial. Regarding our author's response to what he dubs the logical problem of evil, his solution seems to be dependent on the free will defense. There are issues with that defense, however. I think I'll drop out this PowerPoint for the moment and talk to you straight. So there are problems with that issue. If we do have free will, and some philosophers have even challenged that assumption, does that not effectively mean that God either cannot or has fully chosen not to interfere with our decisions? Either way, regardless of whether it also has a choice or not, to that extent, God is not omnipotent. If you delegate power to another, so long as you do so, they have your power and you do not. On page 98, our author states that God created the best world it can, but he doesn't cite a source to back up this assertion. He apparently expects that to be accepted as true on his face. Page 99, are there, quote, instances of intense suffering which God could have prevented? Well, I've linked a clip to an interview with the noted performer, writer, man of letters, Stephen Fry, where he directly raised that issue. On page 99, we find an unsubstantiated assertion that if the deity permits intense suffering, then there must be a greater good. Now, doesn't that assumption assertion have the tacit implication of the blaming the victim when someone suffers. Um, tacitly, 
tacitly, uh, also doesn't it tacitly assume that the future is static and already predetermined? But if there is predetermination, do we really have free will? On page 100, we find the statement, if indeed it would be seem to require something like omniscience on our part before we could claim to know <coughs> there is no greater good. Isn't this rather more intruding into the area of theology at this point than philosophy? Um, on page 101, we find the statement, if there doesn't exist an omnipotent, omniscient, holy good thing. Sorry, folks, that's assuming a lot. There are a lot of theisms that do not accept one or none of those. For example, Malthus would challenge if the notion that deity is all good. Deists would question whether God deity intervenes in its creation. Polytheists usually have very powerful deities, but they tend not to be either omnipotent or omniscient. In most of the world religions outside of the Abrahamic traditions, there is no problem of evil because few, if any of them, insist that deity is simultaneously omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. Our author seems to assume a false dichotomy that either you accept the Abrahamic deity or you have to be an atheist. There are many, many more theisms than the Abrahamic one which might actually be better alternatives than we just thought that out there. So let me turn to page 100 and go back to my PowerPoint. So so on page 101, we find an argument that is premised on the notion that the immense degree to which God's knowledge would exceed our own is a case, honestly, of what we call in the field appeal to ignorance, sometimes called arguendo ad ignoratio, as I've written it, but also sometimes argumentum ad ignoratium. Um, that's an argument from ignorance, and folks, that is per se a logical fallacy. On page 102, we find the statement, if arguments from analogy are weak. Um, but if that is the case, as the author asserts, should we not then just toss aside the entire Anglo-American common law system, which is premised as per this principle of stare decisis upon making analogies from settled legal principles. Page 103. We find the statement, God too will almost always be consciously present to humans, if not to other animals. I have to ask, why not? Source? Uh, honestly, in my experience, animals engage in a lot less cupidity or viciousness for its own sake than your average human. A mountain lion, for example, uh, if it attacks you, it does not do so because it wants your car or your gems. It does so because it's hungry and you look like a good meal. Page 103 through 106, the problem I see with most of the theodicies that he brings up is that they tended, tend to quote unquote solve the problem of evil by uh, limiting or circumscribing either God's omnipotence, omniscience, or omnibenevolence, but they do not admit to doing so. Uh, the argument from all uh, that we have free will and God will not impose upon that, well, that's a limitation on God's omnipotence, for example. Oh, and on page 106 through 107, and folks, this is the third extraordinary, extraordinary thing that our author does in this chapter. I promised you I'd get there. What our author typifies as the G.E. Moore shift is nothing more than the distinction between what's called modus ponens and modus tollens. Modus ponens and modus tollens are classic syllogisms. In Aristotelian logic, the whole point of the syllogism is that if you have two statements of fact that fit the syllogism, 
then that logically implies a third statement, which must be true. So let me break those down. So modus ponens, if P, then Q. P, therefore, you have Q. Modus tollens, P, therefore, Q. Not Q, therefore, not P. Let me give a classic uh, example. Notice ponens, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Um, notice ponens, all men are mortal. Socrates is not mortal, therefore Socrates is not a man. Let me share one final comical example about the structure of modus ponens and a good example of why it's so essential to get the order of statements in a logical syllogism correctly. Uh, as you see in this cartoon, uh, we see an inversion of modus ponens. Man is by nature a political animal, so is a bear. I, a political animal, animal therefore, I'm a man. Uh, I feel that's not a valid syllogism, and of course, the bear goes wild. Well, this is, at least in the area of philosophy, what we consider a pretty good joke. So, any thoughts, any questions, any observations? What do you think? Has our author really succeeded in making a valid argument to resolve the problem of evil? in the context of the Abrahamic traditions? Or could the resolution be to focus instead on one of the other many theisms that do not have the problem of evil? This folks is what we call the principal parsimony, sometimes called Occam's razor, sometimes the simplest answer. Usually the simplest answer is the best. There you go, there's my thoughts. I mean, email me if you have any responses to this video or the print form, this announcement. Ciao.